joining us for the webinar, Skill Acquisition versus Talent Acquisition, Breaking the Myth, in partnership with Simply Learn. This is Ritika from Pickle Matters, and before moving to the agenda of the day, let me give you a brief of the topic. Digital transformation is progressing at a phenomenal pace, and the demand for skilled digital professionals far outweighs the availability. The pressing issue for L&D teams remains figuring out the most efficient and cost-effective way to scout and integrate these digital experts seamlessly into their organizations. People Matters and Simply Learn conducted a research earlier in August to understand the strategies implemented by the L&D function to bridge the talent gap in their organizations. The study reveals how L&D teams across different sectors are designing innovative learning models for reskilling and upskilling existing talent. More crucially, the study also reveals certain myths about the digital age. This webinar looks to bust these myths, present a more accurate reality, and provide some best practices. Myth number one, talent acquisition is an indispensable approach for success in the digital age. Myth number two, return on investment from L&D initiatives is tough to quantify. Myth number three, even if the business needs change, there is no compelling need to recalibrate L&D framework. And also, we cover the best practices like how some of the leading technology giants have taken digital technology training to the next level. Let me now introduce the speakers for this webinar. We have the privilege of having with us Mr. Krishna Kumar, CEO, Simply Learn, and Ms. Chetna Munshi, Head L&D Global GSC, Ericsson India. As the CEO of Simply Learn, Krishna is responsible for accelerating growth and driving new business opportunities for the organization's online courseware and learning approach. As a leader, Krishna brings a rare combination of creative, analytical, and operational skills. He believes in balancing technology with human interaction in delivering a world-class learning experience. Krishna is part of the prestigious 40 under 40 list for three years in a row. He earned his engineering degree from NIT Suratkan. Apart from exploring his entrepreneurial skills, Krishna is fond of athletics, is interested in reading books of all genres, and has a passion for teaching and learning. An L&D professional with 20 plus years of experience across industry, Chetna has led large global teams across domains, as well as set up learning functions in two organizations in her career span. She is currently heading L&D function in Ericsson, India. She is responsible for L&D activities across all global delivery centers. Prior to joining Ericsson, India, she was general manager with HCL Technologies. Our partner today for the webinar is Simply Learn. Simply Learn is one of the world's leading certification training providers. They partner with companies and individuals to address their unique needs, providing training and coaching that help working individuals achieve their career goals. With a library of 400 plus courses, Simply Learn has helped 500,000 plus professionals advance their careers, delivering $5 million in pay raises. Simply Learn has partnered with several organizations in their digital transformation journey by providing unique solutions on upskilling their talent. We have saved time for you to ask questions at the end of the webinar. For those watching live webinar, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A section. We will respond to as many questions as time allows. We have an exciting topic to discuss in this webinar today. So without any further delay, let me invite Mr. Krishna and Ms. Jetna to take over. Over to you guys. Uh, thanks, Ritika. Good morning, everyone. This is Krishna speaking. And first of all, let me welcome you all of, all, all of you again uh, to this webinar. It's my pleasure to speak with you along with the industry leader, uh, Chetna Munshi. 
and also uh, let me start this session by admitting that i'm not a trained hr or an lnd professional but i had the privilege of working with uh, many uh, hr and lnd leaders uh, in the last 7-8 uh, years and so I, I would bring an outside perspective on this topic on uh, on how do we see uh, some of the challenges uh, of the organizations or organization on digital skilling being handled by a lot of hr leaders and how some how an outsider like simply learn has been helping them and my co-presenter -pres chetna she is going to talk about how this problem is being viewed by a large global enterprise like uh, erection uh, and she will bring in the insider uh, perspective on this particular topic. To be on the same page, uh, describe wh what do we mean by skill acquisition and what do we mean by uh, talent acquisition. When we say talent acqu acquisition, we are trying, we are referring to getting talent from outside an enterprise. And when we are referring skill acquisition, we are referring to training the existing employees on a new skill that's required by the enterprise to do whatever they want to achieve as their enterprise goal. So this context will move on, move on to the next slide. If you look at the uh, uh, human history for the last uh, 300 years, there has been massive changes brought in by new way of doing things, new technology, new discoveries that has a huge impact on our lives, right? So if you if you see the one of the biggest um, discoveries of 18th century, it was all about like steam engine. It was about mechanical production, and that that has a huge impact on how people used to live their lives during those times. Like I'll just, just give you some more context on this whole uh, mechanical um, automation that happened in 18th century. So if you remember, before 18th century, the, the global world powers were uh, Ottoman Empire of uh, Turkey. But within a very short period of time, within a, within a hundred year period, the global power moved from Turkey to Europe. And one big, biggest factor that impacted this move was uh, discovery of printing press that was completely a mechanical device that allowed uh, Europeans to print books, to share knowledge. So think of it as an, as, as an internet um, equivalent during those days. Like one of the powers that, it, that internet has brought us is that information is available on your fingertips. There was a similar kind of impact by the, created by the printing press in 1800th century that let Europeans become more knowledgeable, they become more, more aware, and over a period of time, they really surpassed Turkey and they became a, a superpower. Just a small invention and the kind of profound impact it had uh, during that time. So when you move from uh, 18th century to 19th century, uh, the world discovered electrical power. And that again had a huge uh, impact. A lot of industries started getting created and that created a totally uh, different kind of ecosystem. And then again, after 100 years, we had uh, automobiles, we had IT coming up and um, impacting the way you, we live our lives. But if you look at the pattern, most of the profound changes were happening every 100 years. So every 100 years or so, we, the world was discovering something new. But what is happening in today's world is that what used to happen in 100 years is happening in 10 year or even shorter time frame. And, and that has created a different kind of problem altogether. And that problem is what we are going to talk about and how, how our organizations are handling this, this problem of change. Change was always there in the world, but the speed at which change is happening is much faster than what it is today. While I'm speaking on this topic, if you have any questions, please feel free to keep writing on the chat window. It is appropriate. We might take the, those questions at that point of time itself. And of course, there will be some time towards the end of the session to take uh, Q&A. Uh, just to quote uh, some of the thought leaders from, uh, leaders from the industry about the changes that are happening in the, in the world because of this whole digital disruption, there are some thought leaders that, who are predicting, and maybe they are predict, predicting rightly so, that many companies who do not transform themselves at a speed that it is required to transform, they might be out of business very soon. And like what John Chambers said that 40% of the businesses might not exist in the next 10 years. While it's a problem, it's also a great opportunity for a lot of entrepreneurs because if 40% of the fortune companies do not exist in the next 10 years, it also means that there will be 40% new companies will become fortune companies who do not exist today. So this digital disruption is a problem for a lot of large established organization, it's also an opportunity to create many new businesses that do not exist at this point of time. Like imagine Google, 20 years back there was no Google. I, I, I think most of us can't imagine our life without having a Google kind of search engine today. The only difference uh, is that instead of even 20 years, such kind of changes are going to happen in the next five years. Like there are people predicting that in another 10 years, people might not drive car at all. All the cars will be auto, will be auto driven. Again, that's a huge change that will, uh, that will impact our life.
machine learning and ai is, is another area that is really, really really disrupting even the existence of a human being that they be, they'll become so intelligent intelligent that maybe we start staying with our with them as as our neighbors okay. i just added this uh, slide to show a point on on when we grew up uh, as a kid this is how we, we used to see our uh, offices in movies right i'm sure a lot of you watch movie both hollywood and bollywood movies but imagine how our offices have changed and that change has happened in 30 years again coming back, back to my my earlier point that we saw this kind of massive change in 30 years but maybe the next set of changes might happen in 5 years there's always there's also a prediction that in next 5 years maybe a lot, lot of comp- people will start working from home and most of the companies will rely as much as 50% or even more of their workforce not being their full time employees maybe working from their home working based on assignment and maybe working couple of months in a year not were really working for the entire 12 months to earn their living what all implies to uh, to uh, um, to an organization the since the skills are changing very very ra- rapidly it's creating a massive uh, problem for the enterprises it's ma- creating a massive problem for the enterprises because they they need to be really um, being they have to prepare themselves to have enough skills so that they can work on some of the transformation that they want to drive internally and if if you look at uh, the the surveys being done by independent or organization one of the surveys says that 64% of the cios think that they do not have enough digital skills internally to do uh, to achieve their goals that they are, they are striving to achieve there is also a data point that says that almost 40% of the it workers in india needs to be retrained uh, and this is a nascom data and when we say that the extent of uh, reskilling is not like they learning a new skill nascom predicts that if 40% people don't really reskill them that they, they, they risk the um, they have the risk of losing their jobs and it's, and that is quite a scary and there's a lot of work they are also planning to do in this direction to make sure that there is enough uh, uh, reskilling opportunities available for them to get trained and learn those new skills so in this context of um, digital skills are like changing very rapidly it is like threatening the existence of many organization it's also threatening the existing of professionals working in those areas i'll pass on control to my co-presenter chetna to share how does she looks at this problem in a large enterprise like ericsson and how are they viewing this problem and what are they doing about it so chetna over to you thanks krishna and uh, welcome again everybody i hope i'm audible yes you are chetna uh, okay thanks Okay um yeah to continue with the conversation uh, i think it's very apparent for most of us who are in the industry who have been working for a while even if we've been working for a couple of years a digital skill is the buzzword uh, you know most of the time we hear it both internally within the you know work that we are into the jobs we are into as well as when we go out and uh, interact with our peers across the globe Uh, we hear digital uh, skills being of uh, paramount importance just to give our context to that in a typical uh, organization even if it's not a high tech organization what's been uh, you know, quoted is that almost 20% of our time on an average uh, work day is spent just in searching and gathering information that you require to get your work done so which means almost one fifth of the time that we are spending on an average work day is not to actually do the work it is just to kind of gather the basic information that is required for you to get the work done similarly another almost 28% of the time that we spend typically in a day uh, these days is just to read and answer to the emails that we receive so actually what that leaves us is not even 40% of time that we actually spend on our work that needs to be done so remaining almost 60% is you know either gathering the information around the work or reading about it reading about the mails and gathering that information sorting out that information and then actually getting to the work so a digital enterprise uh, you know what the challenge we are facing is three folds the way i look at it is work is becoming more and more complex uh, and why is it becoming complex because you have that many more people you have that many more stakeholders you have that many more interactions that you need to get done before you can actually decide how and what you need to do to get your work done more efficiently so collaboration becomes a very big thing so in fact most of the large organization these days uh, there is a lot of focus that there are separate teams in many organizations that i'm aware about where collaboration and knowledge management is kind of a separate function that has been carved out because there's so much of information around 
there is a threat that even though we have so much of information uh, at the same time, it is not so easy for people to reach out. It's not so natural for people to collaborate and share that information with the other audiences in the same organization or even outside the organization. So that's one challenge most of the organizations these days are facing. The second one is, of course, with globalization, with more and more organizations globally outsourcing some of their work to other parts of the globe, we are facing a virtual workplace, which means if there is a team of 20 people working on a particular project or an assignment, it's not necessary that most of the people will be physically available in the same place or the same location or even in the same country. So I think for a large enterprise, it's quite common for us to work in a team which is spread across different countries, which is spread across different time zones. So the way of, ways of working, what were traditionally relevant when you had this team in the same location or even in the same country, the dynamics is completely changed when that becomes a virtual workforce. So how you get the work done, how do you share that information, how do you uh, get that information into a, into a shape and form which can be effectively leveraged, uh, that becomes very different in a virtual uh, work environment. And the last I just spoke about uh, that briefly is because there's so much of data and information available, uh, getting that information, the right information at the right time is another challenge. So that's the reason I think people still for any and every information still prefer going to let's say YouTube or going to a Google search or a similar uh, application that might be available in the you know, within the business enterprise because finding that one information piece which is relevant for me at that point in time is is a crucial way of being more effective. So I think these are the three major uh, challenges which any digital enterprise is facing these days. So thanks, Ms. Chitna. So that was a very good uh, uh, thought, Chitna, Chitna, from an insider perspective. In fact, I, I'll share a short story that I had read uh, some time back about IBM that few years back, I think 20 years back or so, IBM was looking at getting into a new area and they couldn't find any information to get started on that new area. So this, so the person who was working on that um, uh, project got this idea that why don't he approaches patent office to see if someone has filed patent related to that area and they approached patent office and they were surprised to find that few of the payment, pay, patents filed in uh, on those areas where by IBMers. Coming back to your point that there's so much of information available within an organization to the extent of having what kind of patent that organization has filed in the past, they were not able to find internally and they had to go outside to get that kind of information. So that, that was always a challenge. Of course, uh, with a lot of new digital uh, tools and uh, 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 tools availability, it has become relatively easier than what it was earlier. But at the same time, since the information has become so much that still we are, in, we are into the same problem. Now coming back to the myths, the first myth that we, that we, uh, uh, that I wanted to talk about is that uh, many times when we think about uh, getting talent in a new area, the natural uh, thought process is that we should go out uh, in the market and try to hire someone who already has that kind of experience and expertise, who can bring in that experience and expertise. And, and, and as an organization, we, we leverage that talent and try to uh, speed up our work. Uh, some of the normal thought process uh, uh, for doing this is that if you do, if you hire someone who is from la who, who who comes with the required experience, it saves time and resources. It's also higher productivity because we don't want to train someone. It will take some ramp up time to get someone, but it's much easier to hire someone someone from outside and, and get started really very fast. Uh, there's also a, a sometimes uh, thought within some of the organization is that uh, if you train people, what if they learn some, this new and, and in demand kind of skill? and they move out of the organization. So these are the, the three thoughts that we have seen uh, going into the minds of many executives when they look at hiring, um, when they look at building skill in a new and an area that the organization might not have the competency. But in reality, uh, the survey and, and, th and this kind of surveys are done by multiple independent bodies. And this, this is also what our sim uh, data was uh, simply learn and uh, people matter survey also shows is that while it appears uh, that hiring lateral costs time and money, but there's a, there's, a, there's a good amount of uh, cost when you, when you look at acquiring talent from outside. The average cost of hiring a senior level talent is roughly about 20% of the CTC, which is, which is quite a significant cost. 
while lateral might come might have the required hard skill uh, that the organization is looking at building and and relying on but whenever someone new comes uh, from another organization to a new organization it, it takes some time, some amount of time for them to get adjusted to the new culture it gets time for them to understand the existing system in place so there is all, so there is always a ramp up time for anyone who knows the skill but still wants to apply that skill in a, in a new setup that they have got hired into so and uh, so that so it's not necessary that a new person comes up and he becomes productive from day one it, there is a time so if you look at hiring someone internally also they also might take time and maybe learn that skill and then the third point related to uh, training people and they learning the skill and they moving and they move on in fact uh, the the global data says that people who come from outside and if they have they have spent significant amount of time in in a one one kind of organization if they move to another or organization the attrition are generally very high people don't get adjusted to the to the to the culture and in general in this is a common data across multiple organization is that the attrition is high among new people so people who uh, people typically leave within the first few months if they don't get, get adjusted to the organization or the or they don't get this the kind of comfort the, or the kind of work environment they are used to working so this is our our view and our last it's not to share her perspective from an insider on how does she looks at um, this statement right uh, so let me kind of go back uh, to let's say about uh, 15 years or 20 years even or maybe even 10 years i would say i have been in lnd domain for a while now and uh, obviously i have interacted with all my peer organizations in hrb talent acquisition b to workforce planning b talent management and others there was always been this hard discussion about uh, should we buy the talent which is, should we acquire it with the talent acquisition team's responsibility or should we really look at growing the growing the talent internally from the existing pool of people that are available um in my experience both have their own place however uh, with the current business reality moving more to higher efficiencies higher uh, you know focus on cost reduction uh better customer satisfaction uh faster pace at which the uh, the workforce is supposed to be uh, doing the job with the required skills and competencies i would say the needle is uh, moving gradually more towards skill acquisition rather than talent acquisition uh, but of course uh, that does not mean that the hiring is stopping of course the hiring has its own place and very important one at that however uh, what i've seen happening is that in most of the organizations particularly in a technology focused or technology where, where technology is the at the at the base or a fulcrum of the the business enterprise uh, talent acquisition as well as skill acquisition i think both these teams are working in a highly collaborative manner to ensure that we only hire talent where we do not have an option of skilling that talent internally so the first option or the first choice of most of the enterprise these days is to look at the talent internally which is available which can be upskilled or cross skilled but of course both upskilling and cross skilling and internal talent comes with its own uh, you know challenge of time money effort and then at the end of the day uh you know you may not get a 100% result in terms of the fitment of the competence however more and more organizations are working out different models uh to ensure that that works because for the reasons that were just stated that cost of acquisition of a talent even though at a middle level and of course this, this cost will go up as the uh the seniority of the resources goes up is much higher than uh, grooming that person or the team of uh, people internally as i said even if you are hiring somebody from outside uh how fit or how easy would this uh, person find to get culturally uh, acquainted with the new ways of working of this organization compared to where this person came from and this kind of becomes more pertinent as the hierarchy or the seniority of that resource you know grows up in the organization so maybe when you are joining an organization with less than 5 years of experience uh it it may be comparatively simpler for you to gel into the new organization but as you grow more in the experience your parameters of what you would like to see in an organization obviously grows that much more so your 
uh, expectation of what you would like in terms of the environment, in terms of the culture, in terms of what you learn from the organization and what you can contribute back to the organization, all those also become a prime factor for a person to decide, you know, whether it was a right move in in terms of making that shift from uh, organization A to an organization B. And in that process, productivity in that process, output of what that person can deliver for the new organization, to some extent, takes a hit. So given all these factors, yes, um, you know, it is, as I said, the needle is more and more shifting towards ensuring that, if possible, uh, what are the options available internally? And of course, wherever that's not an option, for example, we are, as a business, getting into a completely new technology area. We are getting into an area where do not, we do not have the existing skills available in the organization. Then, of course, talent acquisition would be the only option we need to go with. But if we have something available internally and it's a question of scaling it up, uh, it is always a mix and match between what can be groomed internally versus what can be hired from the market. So I think uh, that's something that uh, I would like to say when I, when what I see or what I have seen rather in most of the organizations uh, that I am aware about and I have worked with. So thanks, Shekna. That's an excellent perspective that both are important, but the fulcrum is shifting more towards uh, skill acquisition compared to talent acquisition. Another trend that I see uh, on, being on the same topic is that in the, in the new digital skills, there, there aren't enough talent available outside anyways, because everybody is, is in the same boat, right? People, there are not enough professionals, there are not enough companies working in the new areas, but everybody is realizing the need to get get into those areas because they're kind of threatening the entire existence. So that's, that's, that's another factor also which is pushing more and more companies to start building competency in those areas. So moving on to the uh, uh, second myth is that uh, ROI from L&D initiative cannot be quantified. So this has been, I think, a topic. This is not only related to the digital skills. I think this has been a topic for discussion for quite some time. And there are a lot of uh, one-liners also around it. Like one, I remember all the time that CFO asking a CEO on uh, why are we investing so much on our employees? What if they learn and move on? And then the classic response from the CEO is that what if they don't learn and stay on? That's a much bigger challenge than uh, letting people go on. But uh, we, uh, we have looked at some of the data from some of the research uh, organization as well as we have seen our own data also, is that people really uh, value. If companies are investing on their employees, people really value. There might be some uh, cases of people taking that as an opportunity and moving on, and that's quite normal. But in general, we have seen that 65% um, of the employees say that uh, their job satisfaction has increased post-skilling. In fact, any kind of survey that you do within any organization one of the most common points that comes from employees is that uh, there aren't enough training opportunity provided for them to grow. So even if you pro keep on provide training, there are people who are looking for more and more opportunity to learn new skill and, and grow in, the, in their career. There are a lot of tangible results also that uh, some of the surveys have shown, like one of the surveys that was done by us gave us the data that 80% of the trained employees show a marked improvement in productivity and 60% of them feel more confident of their skills that they and they also feel that they can apply those skills in the current work that they're doing. Then there's another data point that says that companies that invest on training employees earn 24 24% higher profit and 218% higher revenue on, on on each employee. So there are some of the data points related to training, but let me also make a very bold statement here is that in today's world where skills are changing so rapidly, organizations who are too much concerned about measuring the um, ROI from uh, their L&D initiative have the real risk of uh, being irrelevant. Because today, uh, it, it has become as important a function within every organization as it is a talent acquisition. I don't think anybody today questions having a dedicated talent uh, acquisition to team within their organization because that's uh, imperative to have so that you can get more people to get interviewed at your organization and eventually join your organization. Typically, l and as a team is being uh, uh, established only in, in companies who, who have become more organized. But, uh, but now we see a trend wherein um, most of the progressive organizations, however small, small they are, they're trying to have an L&D function right from the beginning so that they can spend time, energies, and also pass on the message to their in entire employee base is that constant reskilling is a reality, and, and as an organization, we are committed to invest in that direction. So I'll pass on to uh, Chitna to share her views, on, and I'm sure she can offer a lot of views because she has been running Ericsson Academy for quite some time. Thanks, Krishna. 
yeah, so let me kind of uh, again take a little step back here. Uh, why is ROI relevant? And of course, the miss is can it be uh, quantified? I think uh, maybe this whole discussion, in my view, uh, started with uh, you know with maybe uh, organizations having L and D teams, which probably were not. Uh, and in some cases are even now uh, not so much in sync with what is the changing business scenario. You know, traditionally, uh, the role of L&D was more like an order taker. It is like business tells you what you need to do. You simply go ahead and ensure that that happens. I think, however, the way I look at the changing face of L&D, and uh, I don't think there is a choice we have as L&D professionals, uh, because if you don't do that, I think there is a there is a huge uh, you know if I may call it a threat to the L and D function as a whole. That how how much are we aligned with what's the business's expectation from learning as a team? And I'm not talking about learning in the uh, in the traditional framework of taking the requirement from uh, from the business stakeholders and ensuring that we kind of deliver that and we move on to the next transaction and so on and so forth. I think we need to uh, take a step back to say, okay, uh, whatever we are delivering as an organization, uh, as an L&D organization, has a relevance to the larger purpose of the business for which this function is uh, catering to. And some of, um, in this slide itself, uh, what I've tried to capture is that, uh, in my experience itself, uh, measuring ROI wherever required, of course, it, it requires time uh, in, uh, in, in terms of creating those data points and then you know making that analysis and then coming back and correlating how relevant would that be but it's definitely possible and it really doesn't matter which domain or which technology or even uh, non technical areas that you want to measure it for it's doable of course the paradigm would shift the data points would shift your methodology may also shift but it is possible uh, in this slide i have tried to give a couple of uh, small, easy, doable ways in which ROI can be measured. Uh, some of you, I'm sure most of you rather, would be aware of uh, Philips ROI model. So traditionally, the Kirkpatrick model, which was, uh, you know, which was at uh, four levels uh, that we had. So typically, we, were, we had the fourth level where we were measuring the, uh, the result, which is, did the training intervention that was done have any impact on the performance of the people who underwent that particular program? ROI uh, or the Philips ROI model actually adds one more layer, which is the fifth layer, which tries to measure traditionally that whatever was the investment that was done for a particular training intervention, what was the return from that? So if you were to measure it in dollar amount or uh, rupees, what went into uh, you know, organizing that program versus what is the enhancement of the skills that are resulted? And if that can be quantified is what essentially we are looking at in terms of measuring the ROI. And some of the ways is you have a control group in which you uh, test it out, you monitor the results before the learning intervention was executed versus after that. You have the, uh, you know, you have the triangulation method in which you are taking different perspectives of how it can be done and of course, most important is that your stakeholders for whom you are doing it and their managers and their leaders actually testifying that whatever has been delivered actually has an impact on the bottom line. Now, I agree with Krishna that uh, it may not be, I mean, we may be killing the bull by overwhipping it, by, you know, chanting about ROI for everything, which is not doable. Even it's not even practically possible because you always, with any function, live with certain constraints in terms of time and resources that are available to you. ROI, in my experience, is worth an exercise, but only for a very, very niche program, which actually can have a, a positive revenue impact on the organization. But for general uh, interventions, which are most of the time run, maybe 80% or 90% of the interventions, Maybe doing it even up to a level four is, I would say, a great attempt uh, for an LND as an organization because at the end of the day, my experience is that business would like to see how is that training program being relevant for ensuring that my workforce is, is faster skilled, is better skilled, is more 
able to solve the customer issues. If that is something we are able to do, uh, I'm not sure whether for those interventions going up to an ROI level or a fifth level uh, would even be required. But yes, wherever required for a couple of programs, uh, if it is felt as a need, uh, there are ways and means of uh, you know doing that for sure. So thanks, Chetna. I also share uh, my experience of working with a lot of enterprises in India. So what we have seen is that uh, when it comes to hard skill, uh, one of the ways in which we are proposing to a lot of our customers, and we have seen a uh, good response on that, is that if there are hard skills that are required by uh, the, the existing employees, and once they acquire those skills, they, are, they can be put on a real uh, customer-facing project. So the way we have been measuring is that uh, put those guys into a training program and at the end of those, uh, that particular training program we measure how how many of them are successfully getting into a project and, and becoming billable. So you have, we did it in uh, I think a uh, couple of uh, um, a large uh, system integrators and we saw very good results wherein as part of the training program itself a project was created that was a kind of a small mini project trying to be like closer to the real project that they are supposed to work on. And since the, the training was all around uh, not just providing them theoretical training about that particular topic, but the whole training was weaved around the project that as you keep on working on that project that was provided as part of the training, and by the time your training is over, you completed that, uh, that uh, so-called mock project successfully, and then appeared for the real interview for a real project and you got selected. So that's how they're measuring the effectiveness that did people, how many, what percentage of people cleared the real project interview at the end of the training. So moving on to the third myth, which is that in the, in the digital age, L&D function need not recalibrate for employee goals. I think this is one of my uh, favorite topic and I've always been speaking to everyone uh, on the fact that whatever, as an organization, whatever be your goal, Unless that goal aligns with the individual goal, however amount of tracking that you do, however amount of pushing that you do, those training programs or those L&D interventions do not work. Because people are more concerned about their own growth, their own career growth. Where do they see themselves going in one year, two years, five years down the line? And if things are aligned as per their aspiration, it really works very well. Like the completion rates, people try to put in extra effort to really go and achieve their goals. So this is, it becomes like, I will say that for any successful L&D uh, initiative, it's very important to find one way or, or another on how do you align their individual aspirations, their goal with what organization is, is trying to achieve. And um, in fact, uh, one of the data points says that 93% of millennials, millennials want lifelong learning and are willing to spend their time and money on further training. When we say they're willing to spend time on, the, on, on their learning, we're also talking about they're spending time other than the time that is required to be put on work if there is an alignment uh, of L&D along with the goal. So if the entire pushing is only based on organization need that this is, these are the competencies that organization is looking at building and, um, and that is the only important goal, it might not work. It, in, in a, in a, it might be a business reality that as an organization you can only spend on what organization wants to achieve. But we, as L&D professional, I think there is a need to somehow figure out, figure out a way through which we can see how those L&D can really add real value to the employee's need. And organizations who have done this well have really achieved great results. I think L&D as a function uh, cannot succeed uh, either by just looking at just one view, which is either a top to bottom view or a bottom up. It has to be both. Uh, while uh, you know, having a top down view has its own relevance because you get the big picture, you understand what are the stakeholders, your primary stakeholders, your leadership, your business stakeholders, your board, you know, wanting the direction in which the organization needs to move. But that just, in, in my experience and my opinion, that is just a starting point. And that's an important starting point because your entire exercise would be uh, going a little haywire if you don't have that input uh, in the first place. So that's definitely very important. However, uh, the crux is, what is it that the organization is looking at in terms of the skills which have a relevance today, which have a relevance maybe one year down the line, and if possible, which have a relevance with the long term, maybe two years to five years kind of a time frame. If we do not merge both these perspectives, which is the top-down perspective, wherein the, uh, the senior leadership of the organization tells you what's the vision that they have in which the enterprise is expected to move, what are the areas domains, technologies, market areas, geographies, uh, business lines in which they would like to grow. And then 
you take that perspective and have those conversations with your uh, you know, uh, project managers, line managers who are actually at the helm of affairs and take more deeper insight into what is it that they are looking at from a competence development, from a learning development or a skill, a skill development point of view, which is relevant, as I said, from a short term to a medium to a long term perspective. And if possible, uh, it's an icing on the cake. If you, if you can correlate what you are hearing from your uh, stakeholders on the ground, the project managers, the line managers, and the other middle managers, and correlate it or draw a parallel between that with what your top management has been able to tell you. And if you are able to at least have a few places where the two are getting mapped, then your vision and the goals are kind of talking to each other. Otherwise, they're going into extreme uh, opposite directions where the vision is going in one direction and your goals of, you know, what you are trying to achieve in the, in, in whichever, you know, long term or a medium term or a short term is kind of not really in sync and it's going in a, in a very different tangent. So I think what is important is that the two have to talk to, talk to each other. And, and it is our job as an LND team where we have to do justice to try to identify what are the common points that can be taken from the first interface, which is the top management, and the second interface, which is your medium, and the, the lower level managers or the junior level managers that you need to talk with, and make that correlation possible. Because that's when your relevance of LND actually comes to the fore. Otherwise, it, it, it kind of, it, it, it might be seen as a more of a transaction-oriented function, which it definitely is not, but depends on how you kind of are able to bring that value to the to your stakeholders and bring that to the fore. To continue that discussion, you know why it becomes even more relevant. If you look at the uh, the picture in this particular slide, which is evolution of LND, and this is only in a span of about 20 odd years. But if you see the plethora of changes that have happened, be it from a technology point of view, be it from the systems that are being used be it from the user group that you are trying to identify, or how are the learning being imparted, let's say somewhere in 2000s when, the, you know, when we were there, and whoever you know, has been in the workforce from them to now maybe can correlate much more, but even for the others who joined maybe a much, much later, you would be familiar with some of this. This is a slide I've taken from uh, Boston. So I found it very relevant because I have probably lived a lot of uh, these systems and these technologies in these areas. Uh, whether it was e-learning when we started off with, and then we moved on to a blended learning, and then we, we saw, okay, uh, you know, we have a talent management, we need to look at it more holistically, and hence you have these you know, learning management systems that came into the picture, and then, uh, you know, then there was this issue of how effective are the learning management systems in today's day and time, and then we are talking about LRS learning storage systems. So, I mean, there are the various technologies which are changing over a period of time. In between, we also had, even now that's relevant, is creating learning paths or learning curriculum. You know, doing the more customizable learning rather than giving the user an access to 20,000 courses from a particular, uh, you know, vendor where that person enters and doesn't know what to do and, you know, takes a hasty exit. Maybe customizing it to a role, customizing to a group of people, customizing to a project that they are working on, making it more relevant to them. That's what I think uh, learning paths attempt to do. And then we, of course, nowadays or in the last couple of years, five years, ten years, we're talking about more on continuous learning. So it's not only learning in the classroom. Uh, nowadays, you hear learning is either a macro learning or a micro learning. Micro learning are your short bursts of learning. It could be just giving an access to a particular article. You go through a particular video, or you have you know some uh, email that comes to you, which gives you a very different perspective of a particular skill. But those are short bursts of learning, a small delta change that you are looking at. Whereas a macro learning is when you are starting afresh. It could be a new technology. It could be a new domain. It could be a different. Uh, area that you are getting into, a different field that you are getting into. So you need to start from a scratch. And the, the intensity of the learning obviously would have to be that much more in-depth. You can't do a 
cursory learning of by, by just seeing a video or by just going through a particular online course and that's good enough. You have to do probably a combination of a lot, of, a lot of things. You have to go to a formal learning. You have to maybe supplement it with some MOOCs, some videos, some articles, some experiential learning, and only then can somebody say that, okay, this person has reached a competency level which is good enough for us to kind of get going in terms of implementing that technology. So I think nowadays what we have seen, as I said, a shift in the last almost 15 to 20 years has been so massive that it's impossible for us sitting within the LND team not to be able to constantly calibrate and recalibrate as to what are the changes happening? And then most importantly, as a function, what do I need to do differently? It could be my ways of working. It could be the way I'm implementing a solution. It could be what is the kind of learning experience that we have been able to give to our audience, which will make that learning that much more impactful. Coming back to whether we are talking about return of investment, whether we are talking about impact of learning, all that is uh, only possible if you are grounded to what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis in your organization. You are able to constantly change your ways of working. I, I saw one of the questions there, how relevant is change management? I think most relevant. Because every single day we are seeing changes all around us, changes in technology, changes in the profile of the people we need to train, changes in terms of the system that we are using to impart training, changing in terms of the experience levels of people that we train. I think everything is changing. There is nothing which is not changing. The only constant is the change in itself. So if we do not really have a sense of what has changed, then we will be in that you know, phase of who moves my cheese. We don't even know what has happened. We won't even know what we need to do to, be, to remain relevant, to remain a function or a group of people who is seen as something which knows what they're talking about and they're not living in, let's say, a 2000 or a 2005 when the reality of the business and reality of the organization was very different than what we're talking about is 2017 where everything is that much more different and 20, 2018, I'm sure, will be very different from 2017 in itself. So it's every time recalibrating, relooking, and then coming back with your change strategy as to how do you then, in the new avatar, make yourself and keep yourself that much more relevant. So thanks, Sitna. I think that was a very uh, good detailed explanation on how things have changed in the last 20 years. also wanted to add one, small, uh, one or two small data point is that um, in, in many organizations, when we partner with uh, them to provide training to their employees, we have seen a marked increase wherein you just provide the training and the cases where you try to provide training with an external certification. In, in, in cases of external certification, we see people uh, uh, get this feeling that these certificates are going to remain with them for, for their life. And in general, uh, their entire participation in the, in the process increase, increases dramatically, in some extent by almost like 100%. There is another observation that we have seen in the last one year is that uh, we offer a lot of courses, but recently we started offering courses called master's program. Master's program is nothing but uh, uh, rules that you can get prepared. Like, for example, we have a master's program on data scientists. We have a master's program on cloud architect. And within a span of one year, these courses have, have grown much. The demand for these courses have, have grown much more rapidly than, than what used to provide earlier. So the, if there is a very clear-cut goal, I think that excites a lot of people to follow that path and uh, take up those courses. I'm just complimenting to your thought that this learning path concept has, has become really, really a, the de facto standard at this point of time. Unless you show a very good learning path to, to their employees, in general, the participation is not very high. But if the learning path is aligned to their career goal, the participations are way, way too higher. So with this, we'll move on to the uh, next uh, topic about a small case study that, we, that, that I'd like to share. So one of our customers, which is one of the largest um, consulting companies in the world, they started their entire journey of digital disruption uh, uh, recently. Not, so like a couple of years back, they started thinking about the digital disruption. They started realizing the fact that unless they transform their own business, which was like traditional IT, they, risk the, they have the risk of uh, being irrelevant and maybe going out of the business in the next 10 years or so. Now, uh, we, we partnered with them and we started providing a lot of training for their employees across multiple countries. 
and within a very short period of time itself they have seen almost 40 to 60 percent of their business uh, across different verticals some vertical it has it has it 40 percent plus businesses has become digital some vertical as much as 60 to 70 percent of their business has already become digital that means they started getting they are they are in, in fact uh, helping their end customer tra do digital transformation and help them ad adopt the new technologies to do better than what they were doing it earlier now since we have limited time i'll pass on to chetna to share her uh, experience on the whole skill transformation journey okay thanks uh, i think i'll not uh, spend much time on this i would like to maybe give uh, more time to the q and a here but just very briefly uh, everything we spoke about today i would want to correlate with, with one big theme which is the learning culture irrespective of what kind of organization uh, you know one is into uh, i think it's extremely important uh, and we talked about cultural fit we talked about productivity we talked about you know every other data point if an organization is learning uh, you know there's agility in terms of the learning uh, and i would call it here not in terms of the technology but generally the culture of the organization is more as they believe in learning and that doesn't really mean how many hours of training has somebody undergone that's not a measure it's more of how easy or difficult it is for somebody to pick up a conversation with somebody in the organization could be a senior could be a peer could be somebody from the other team and learn more about it because we are getting more and more into a phase where learning is much more and goes much more beyond the classroom learning. So some of the ways in which we in Ericsson have, uh, you know, attempted skill transformation is, and we have tried to merge the different parts of the uh, people, be it the employees, be it the managers or leaders, and then merge that with how does the process come into the picture? What are the kind of platforms that you need? What are the kind of technology you should have to enable learning? So I think till all these things don't come together, that means your employees have a certain responsibility, managers and leaders have certain responsibility, your process and technology kind of only come as a glue to put all these things together. And of course, culture is a big contributor to the entire effort. How does it help the system, you know, come together wherein everybody is learning? And in today's time and world where everything we spoke about is changing so, so, so frequently, uh, you have to have not one, not two, not three, but as many options available to learn from. Could be a peer learning, could be an experiential learning, could be a learning informally through a blog, through a video, through something. That's only possible if you are able to put all these elements together and in a framework which enables and which encourages people to learn. I think I will uh, kind of leave it at that, and maybe if uh, we can move on uh, to the next slide, and that should be q and I guess. While you were speaking, I also had a chance to look at uh, some of the questions. I'll just uh, read out two questions who are, which are ad addressed directly to me, and um, those questions were, are more related to Simply Learn. One of the questions is from Nidhi saying that how do Simply Learn align their training programs to meet other organizations' need? How do you quantify, measure the results output during during and after the training program along with the organization? And then there is a question from Monica saying that um, I, I have a question on ROI. How can a ROI be calculated for technical training and hard skill? Now, this might be a question but that is very related to, to uh, Simply Learn offering. So I advise both of you to like um, uh, write to me separately so that we can set up a, a, a separate one-on-one -on -one session and, and talk more about some of our experience of working with other organizations. I think that will be good good use of everyone's time. So I, I'll also reach out to both of you to talk about it separately. And then there was a point, a very interesting uh, question from someone saying that we spoke about uh, laterals coming into the organization and uh, there might be a cultural fit issues, not only with laterals, there are also cultural fit fit issues if you hire someone who is uh, who is a fresh hire. So in the context of, of the uh, presentation that I, I was talking about, my meaning of lateral was not only... Uh, getting someone who is experienced to come within within the organization my meaning was that if somebody is already working within within an organization he might be trained on some kind of skill and if you want to acquire if you want to train him on a new skill that's always better than hiring anybody from outside now whether that hiring is um, of a experienced professional or a fresh professional is the same thing because they might not know the your current organization so that was, that was more in context of that that somebody who's already worked in an organization for some time they are either they, they are they start appreciating the culture. They may, maybe maybe they get used to the culture, 
So at least they are not culturally new to the organization. So this is not in reference to just getting the experienced people. Okay, I'll pick up uh, one more question that's been there. Uh, I think it's uh, by Anjum Sheikh, where you say that uh, how do you see HR technology affecting the future skill gap? For example, chatbots, uh, etc., and they're going to even uh, replace talent acquisition. My view is uh, they definitely have a place, uh, technology, be it AI, be it I mean, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, chatbots, and chatbots, and you have whatnot coming in every single day that we see here. All of them have a place, uh, and it's just a matter of time before some organizations ad you know, uh, adapt or adopt this uh, earlier than the others. However, I don't think, uh, in my opinion, uh, I don't think that this is going to replace uh, you know, the way in which business is being done completely. Of course, it will have an impact, like all the technologies that we have seen have an impact on the ways of working, have an impact on how we do business, be it talent acquisition, be it l &D, be it even delivery team, be it sales team, be it whatever. So technology definitely has a role to play and a large role to play, and it is becoming more and more relevant uh, as we are getting more into the digital era. Uh, however, I think um, it would have its own place, and that would not be maybe taking away uh, the human touch. Uh, that would not be taking away some of the things which will still remain relevant today. For example, uh, I know of a lot of organizations, including Ericsson, where we have uh, moved to a lot of things being done virtually in the talent acquisition space. So a lot of things which were done face-to-face -face earlier due to various reasons, travel, time, cost, uh, everything uh, has, has been moved to a different uh, mechanism. And there, I mean, it's up to you as an organization what kind of technology is more relevant and more, uh, you know, fitting your current requirements. So I think that's my view when it comes to using HR technology uh, for, a, for you know, fulfilling the various functions that are being done right now. Thanks, uh, Chetna. I'll just just take the last question, and I think uh, any of any one of you still wants to uh, to contact us, you can definitely get our uh, co contact coordinates from people matter uh, from people matter. So there's a question by Sanjeev Jain on what are the effects of skill initiative by the government of India to bridge the skill gap. So let me tell you that the government always looks at a big problem, and I think at this point of time, NSDC and the government they are more focused on getting more and more people into the job market, and they're they are trying to focus first on the blue collars. So I have not seen a lot of good work by the government, and nor I have seen them really thinking about it in a big time, or about um, how do they skill people who already have some kind of white collar job. I think that the whole focus is more on getting people who are otherwise uh, underemployed, otherwise employed in the agricultural sector, on how they can move to some of the vocational areas like welding, like uh, being an electrician, trained plumber, and so on. So maybe for our kind of industry, I don't think uh, you can expect a lot from government, at least in the near future. Maybe I'll just take one uh, question, which is about MOOCs. Uh, it says that can MOOCs augment learning and organization give credit for the same? My experience in MOOC has been, uh, with so much of change happening, uh, the traditional L&D teams internally in any enterprise would have their own timelines within which a new course can be made available. Uh, and I think that's where, uh, for me, or as an organization like Ericsson or even other organizations that I'm familiar with, they take the help of MOOC very effectively. So it brings in uh, here and now technology, which will take you time internally to develop. It may not fit 100% of your competence needs, but at least it gives you the advantage of starting faster, starting and reaching to a particular level, and then by the time somebody else, uh, something else comes up formally, at least you have some level of competence already built. Uh, and the last question is uh, having the older generation aligning with the new generation or millennials, and how can LAD contribute to it? Again, a very interesting question from Ambika, uh, sorry, Ambalika. Uh, I think here, one of the ways in which I have tried to do this is that you have to create forums, and essentially we should be informal forums where you have different generations coming together and interacting with each other. So leaders as teachers could be one effective way of doing it. You have some senior leaders coming in and interacting and sharing their experience. It's a feel-good factor for the senior audience. It's a good learning to the lesser tenured audiences. So I think that kind of is one way of looking at that. 
Uh, looking at the time, I think we are running out of time, but uh, thanks a lot, everybody. I think for me, it was a very enjoyable interaction. I hope uh, all of you, uh, you know, also benefited uh, from whatever uh, we had to share. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chetna. Thanks, everyone, for uh, listening to us. You. I also really enjoyed this whole session. Thank you, Krishna and Chetna. Uh, indeed, uh, what an informative and uh, really an in-depth session, you know, in our hour. Um, thank you for the great insights. Uh, we request our listeners to uh, please provide their feedback in the survey link that has been provided in the chat section because uh, your input matters. Uh, we have a lot of questions, as you know, uh, from our listeners still coming in, but uh, due to time constraints, I request Krishna and Chetna to actually take them offline, please. Uh, once again, we thank today's webinar partner, Simply Learn. We would like to send our special thanks to both our speakers for this webinar and invaluable information that uh, they have shared with us today. I would also like to thank everybody in the webinar audience. Stay tuned for many more such exciting sessions. Thank you and have a great day.